<laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I'm expecting, you know, the Labour Party big shout. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Ellsford Village Club, our home, our local business people here, and we're supporting them tonight. So we welcome you to our public event on fracking. We have a lot of good speakers here who has in-depth knowledge about what we are here to talk about tonight. We're going to open the floor up later on for questions and I would like you to help me to give a big round of applause to all our speakers that are here and the ones that are on the floor as well. Let's give them a round of applause. when you are speaking and your time is about to finish this gentleman here this have a look on that side will raise up the paper to say to you you need to start rounding up we're very strict with time our first speaker tonight so that we can finish quickly and then we can run to the bar have a drink and have a selfie <laughs> Yeah. Marian and Pisa, you're welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, our first speaker is Geza. Geza, over to you. Thank you very Take much. it away. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the, uh, the energy and the introduction as well. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. My name is Geza. Geza Fratman. Uh, I changed my name after Quadrilla, the uh, company that wanted to frack Blackpool. Uh, frack my house. Uh, I live five miles away from the pre sale farm site and uh, when the earthquake that uh, happened, that uh, was uh, started by Quadrilla, uh, with the very first and only fracture in this country, uh, it damaged my house five miles away. So uh, ever since then, once I found out about fracking, I've been fighting uh, fracking successfully in our community uh, to the point where we've cost Quadrilla over £200 million. Pounds. <laughs> 200 million pounds. Uh, stop six sites down there. There's four and three of the sites are now, uh, two of the sites are back to fields. One site at Beckinsall is uh, going to go back to a field. That's down to the fabulous group of Reef, River Lester against Bracken. And uh, yeah, so, and today, well, I'm not, I'm not going to leave that, but I'm going to remind me about rep. Oh, I'm going to tell you. Today in Lincoln, right, what it is with, with fracking, how many people know about fracking? everybody so we know that there's, there's fracking into shale there's coal bed methane there's underground coal gasification anybody know about the fourth one no, that's acidization it. well today it got turned down again in lincoln <laughs> Yay! and that is really just down to people and communities getting in contact with each other and working with each other all right and uh, it, it's immense it's absolutely immense because i don't know if anybody knows about the the government they want to bypass uh, the the uh, the planet by getting th the fourth way through acidization because they're not classing it as fracking. So that's how they're trying to get it around there. Well, we closed the door. They already they already had an application turned down last last year, and then we've also got an application turned down. <laughs> you suffered a bit. It's <laughs> warm. Uh, uh, and today was the they had a watered down version basically that got turned down, and also the uh, the. Uh, the, the, there was a, an abandonment as well, which they have to do as well. So it, honestly, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. It's basically ambushing the government. We like that, don't we? We like that. <laughs> ambushing the government. All right. So uh, it, it, we're just winning on every different, every every single level. Now, my original uh, group that I got together was called Frack Free Files, which is up in Lancashire. Now the part part of the group has never never been to be insular and just work for and, and stop quadrilla where we are. I've always done it that we're going to work work on a global. So you need to finish it locally to affect it globally because it's all the same corporations that are, are, are uh, you know the financing it all around the world. So you know just to to to, to uh, beat it locally. Now the only problem with frat free filed is nobody can remember it. Nobody can say it was F Y L D E. So now what I'm doing is so there's no borders. It's now called Team Frack Free. All right, no borders. I've got anywhere in the country joining up, in, uh, uh, you know, uh, legal teams and experts. So I've got, I'll travel anywhere on my own bike. I've dedicated 2017 uh, to just literally stopping fracking. 
you know, every single day, every breath of mine, just stopping fracking. So team frack free. There is no, there are no rules. It's very simple. We've got a motto. We trust each other. We believe each other. We get the job done. And boy, are we getting the job done. Seriously, getting the job done. You may, you may have heard, we've, we've had uh, many wins against Quadrilla, £200 million pounds, closing six sides down. Uh, Quadrilla recently have just said that they had to uh, cut the staff by 25%. They've had to relocate. They are bleeding, they are sinking in the field in Lancashire on Preston New Road. Uh, uh, right now, they just had a, the latest accident. Every well they've done so far, they've had problems. They're out now, out, they've hit a spring and it's flooding the site. This site is, is four. It's, it's the size of four rugby pitches. It's probably going to be the biggest pad in the world. So we don't want that record. But what it is with Preston New Road, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be in the right place. I'm sort of pre-car crash, if you will. I mean, you know, when you hear about people and they've been in a maddening accident, but why me? Why me? I'm in a position now where I can actually make sure that Quadrilla stops it for the whole country. Because the thing is, we've got the site there. They're breaking, they're breaching every single condition. We've got the police abusing and, and, and attacking people, attacking counsellors, uh, uh, people with disabilities, throwing women to the floor. Mm. You know, so what we're doing, what I'm doing is I'm recording that, making sure people know about it. We put in a bus on at the end of every month. I mean, I'd love to invite Barry up there if you'd like to come up on the next one at the end of the month. It'd be absolutely fantastic. It's a bus in a safe, a double decker bus that goes up to the site. You can overlook the site, see the scale of the site, and we have speakers on there as well to make sure that you know, you know, uh, you know the dangers and you know uh, uh, how we got to the position. Because the thing is, we had a group of people, local people, that worked really, really hard to get the decision at Lancashire County Council to get them turn it, to turn it down. They turned down Preston New Road, they turned down Rosica, and uh, a Quadrilla appealed it. Secretary of State, Sajid Javid. <laughs> Sajid Javid, he overruled that, uh, and that's, what, that's why now uh, Quadrilla are now in that field since 4th of January. They've been there six months. We've, been, we've put them way behind time with all different ways of, of, of fighting them. The thing is, I don't just fight it in, in, in the council. I fight it from the gates. I fight it to the point now where we're now at judicial review against Sajid Javid. Right? The appeal, I know, we're written them. I'm a street fighter. All right. So what it is, so the judicial review, we've got pressure rolled, site specific, that's about the noise and visual amenity. And mine is about, <laughs> get this, get this, right? I'm a kids entertainer DJ. Well, I was. I've lost it. Right. I mean, that's all gone now. Um, so I'm fighting this now. I'm now a change band. I'm now a full-time campaigner. So I've lost my house, my wife, my job, everything to fight this. No, 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 no. Two hundred billion pounds, quadrilla. <laughs> Worth every penny. Right. My life changed because of that. My point being is, uh, where was I? Lost my thread. The judicial review. Uh, I am now protecting the environment protecting the climate uh, and health and safety. I'm an environmentalist. How did that happen? Because the thing is, what you've got to worry about, I mean, people going about fracking is really, really bad. It is bad, but also it's galvanised communities. It's galvanised people like me. And what it is now, I, I open, a, 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 you know, a, a, the internet, and I look, it, it's opening my eyes to other things as well. It's empowering me. It's, it's making me realise I can say no, and when you work hard, you can make sure it, it ends. All right? And that's what it is. It's empowerment. And we've got people now in communities that, because of fracking, are now becoming councils, and now becoming MPs, and now, you know, they would have never thought of that before. They're taking on the councils. The councils used to be this little, this hierarchy. You know I me, mean? look at Kensington now, the where they have the spotlights on them now. Yeah? What was I saying to you? That they, you know, they were untouchable. Well, they're not anymore. We took on our planning officer called Stuart Perigo. We'd already passed four wells. What the first thing we did was we got we got the planning got the uh, the application going for the planning committee. Then we could fit spoon feed the planning committee to absolutely slaughter Stuart Perigo. It was a sad sight, it was like being hit with questions. Right, and what happened was they asked him the questions and it, they turned it down. So this man that already rubber stamped four wells, had already rubber stamped four sites. The next two sites when we knew about it, well, sing, including Singleton, they all got turned down. Because the evidence is overwhelming. When I first started, there was eight peer review reports. There's now over 800 peer review, review reports against fracking. All right, how long have I got left? 
How many? Two. Two minutes! Two eyes. Oh, I met the great man himself. When I had the judicial judicial review. What you what you I don't know, if you go on to Frat Free File, you'll see my history back for the since mid 2012. And what it is, because I do work alone, uh, I can flit around a bit and I can get in places where not you know other people don't do, it's a bit crazy. <laughs> right? But uh, uh, Jeremy was next door. We had the the uh, the, second, uh, the judicial review in Manchester, and he just had to be in the uh, workers' uh, museum in Manchester. It was right next door. I thought, I can't let that go. <laughs> um, so anyhow, I met him and I explained to him about uh, you know the fact that we just uh, had a judicial review uh, against Sajid Javid. <clears throat> I was waiting for the result. I'll tell you what, you will not meet a nicer man. He was just warm, welcoming. I gave him a number. But he didn't give me a call, right? <laughs> we'll sort that out in a second or two. All right, what it was, I gave him a number, but he should have, I should have said, send. I don't know what about his number, but that didn't, that didn't work. So, but the thing is, it was warm, he asked about it, and the one thing I did say about him, I said, you know, when uh, the, the government are talking about the desolate north, we're not the desolate north, you know what I mean? When they talk about, you know, uh, setting up to the, the northeast and the northwest, uh, Mecca is a sacrifice on. We are not, we are the force from the north. We are the force from the north, and nobody pushes around. Nobody says they're going to frack our land, and and the thing what they're doing now, we are frack central. I'm going to explain why we're frack central. They want to put a gas power station there that the Chinese are going to be paying for. They want to put uh, gas storage there in unstable salt mines that has been defeated by the local community for, for 15 years. It was turned down by one secretary of state, the later secretary of state passed it. They want to frack us. They've got a college there that's going to be a, a, an energy HQ. It will be an energy HQ, but when we stop fracking, it'll be clean energy HQ. But it's still classrooms, that's what it is at the end of the day. All right, so that's what it is. So what we're going to do at the end of the day is we're going to beat this government. And fracking's that bad, I have always believed it will end the Tories. It is that bad. And when people realise, it, they're out. And the one final thing, a bit, one final bit, I'd like to give you a good, a good story as well. Jed Sullivan is the local campaign, uh, the local candidate uh, for Labour. Uh, on the day of the election, on the vote, he actually won. He beat Mark Menzies. He beat him on the day on the vote. I do believe. I don't know. <laughs> but it, I, it, I was told it beat him on the day, but it was the polls of votes that were that were, that, that were cast before the actual day. So you actually beat him on, you know, beat him on, on the on the vote once the mandate come out. I just like that. Just and, and, and it's been conservative since 18 something other, you know, in one guys or another. So that is a huge. And what I'm saying to you, the momentum now is with the Labour Party, with Jay saying and, and the thing is, vote for the man is what I'm saying. And I'm not, I, I wasn't a Labour voter, you know what I mean? But convince me, vote for the man. I think he's an honourable man. I've met him. Give me a call. All right. <laughs> Have first course, we're going to have you know the mini step, you know, first course. So that's what's coming next. Um, with this beautiful lady here, Catherine, over to you. Okay, hi. Um, so, um, hard act to follow, Gazer. I've known him for some time. Um, I met, I'm from Balkan, and I met Gazer when we had the big protest there in 2013. Um, we've seen each other a lot since in Lancashire, elsewhere. Um, it's got us both all over the country, all over Europe. Um, it's a big thing and a big movement, a big um, movement of people, and that is what's going to kill this thing. But what I want, to, I'm, I'm the sort of technical moment here. Um, not too technical, I hope. Um, so Lancashire. Shale is quite clearly, simply shale, horribly shale, but um, the companies have applied to frack the shale. Here in Kent, us in Sussex, um, the picture's more complicated. I mean, in 2013, um, there were groups in East Kent, um, members of them here now, um, and a hydrologist who much helped them here now too. Um, who defeated um, 
the company that was aiming to um, extract um, gas from um, from coal beds, coal bed methane. Um, what you're also facing potentially is extraction of oil from the from the shale and from layers of limestone within the shale. So we're talking about, I mean, the, the, com the, the communities that are most in the firing line at the moment are in Sussex and Surrey, and Jill, who's going to follow me, is going to tell you about what's happening there. Um, so we're talking about a large area across the southeast of England. So from the South Downs National Park, north of, of Portsmouth, um, looking to, from your direction, going across, across the wheel, ducking under um, Guildford, and then out to Tunbridge Wells, and then down towards to the coast of Ryan Hastings Battle. Um, so that part of the wheel that's in, in Kent. Um, yeah, so more complicated. You, the, you have basically three ugly sisters. Up there in the north they have one. Um, and they are they have a deep, deep layer of, of shale. Ours is shallower and um, that there, there is shale right across the weald. But in the weald they have an option. Um, they're not obliged but I mean the, the F word became politically toxic um, because Communities don't want this, and um, a majority of the British population doesn't want it. The um, the Labour Party is against it. The Lib Dems are against it. The Greens are against it. Labour is now very strongly against it. Uh, it's the, for some reason that the, um, the Conservative Party has a, a fracking fetish, and with a <laughs> <laughs> uh, supply and um, what's it called? Um, supply and support arrangement now from the DUP, also for it, UKIP was for it, but it became toxic. So, what they have been able to do, the um, government in league with the um, the uh, the oil companies is um, forget the F word for the moment and go for the A word. So for acidizing. Um, so we now all need to get our our tongues around the A word. Um, so um, like fracking, terribly similar to fracking. We're talking about industrialization of the wheels because the guys who are wanting to do this I mean the CEO of UCOG in um, in the center of sort of near um, Gatwick and south of there um, has said that he's planning um, wells back to back we're talking about hundreds of wells thousands of wells potentially because whether you're acidizing or fracking you're going into impermeable or barely permeable rock formations. So you have to stimulate them as the industry says. You have to either crack them open, crack them open with um, with pressurized water and chemicals or you have to dissolve um, passageways through them, which you can do in the case of the limestone strata that you find in the weald within that um, shale uh, um, within that shale um, deposit. So the weald, I mean Back in the times of dinosaurs, think Jurassic Park, um, it was quite soggy around, around there, you know, um, bogs and, and sea and lake and wet um, sea creatures being dying, being deposited, um, uh, clay drifting down to the bottom, sometimes limestone also drifting down. So within the shale, which is basically brittle clay um, in layers with tiny gobs of, of oil trapped within it, trapped so tightly that it can't get out, um, with, within that great band of shale, you've got bands where there's more um, shellfish material, more limestone stuff that was deposited 
um, with these animals at, at, back in the day, in the time of the dinosaurs. And um, so in those layers, and they're not necessarily very deep, uh, maybe sort of 40 meters deep or something, at Balkan certainly are, our um, Kimmeridge limestone, as it called, is, is um, about 40 meters deep. It's about half limestone, half clay. Um, you can um, use acid, in our case hydrochloric acid, with some other organic acids as well, and some other um, uh, chemicals to help it along, quite a lot of other chemicals, potentially, to help it along. Um, you can you can um, make pathways um, dissolve what they call wormholes through the limestone, and that's an alternative way of getting the oil out of of the rock. Um, so for the time being, they're saying no, we're not fracking, um, which gets some brownie points with the press, media, um, makes it a bit of a non-story really. Um, yeah, there, there they are. They're all called frac free, or frac free whatever, and are uh, not fracking. Well, it could very well be, it is very, very likely that they will, at um, this early stage, if we let them, um, sink their wells and acidize those limestone layers, but that afterwards, once the land is solid, once they've spent millions already on, the, on their wells, who then is going to tell them to stop? I mean, they'd get sued. International court. I mean, once they've got their drills in the ground, you're stuffed. So, if they do come your way, then certainly do make sure that you and people around you are up and early enough. We in Balkan didn't know about it at all. We didn't hear about it for, for a couple of years. It got it got sort of whisked through um, planning in a slightly unconventional kind of way. And um, by the time we were um, Arms, um, the battle had already begun and and, um, and Cordula were already well entrenched. So um, I'm not being technical enough here. Um, so, um, yeah. So, yes, acidizing raises the same kinds of issues as fracking. I mean, one of the biggest issues and the thing against which there's no argument, except for minutes, is, yeah, is industrialization. Um, because because this is impermeable rock, you can only get the oil out of the bits that you've actually cracked. So, um, whereas an ordinary nodding donkey kind of well, it went down into a reservoir, so it would be a trap of oil with impermeable rock over it, but um, the oil would continue to flow into that trap through permeable rocks. The difference with shale and the difference with the Kimmeridge limestone um, that they want to acidize is that it either is impermeable or it has very, very low permeability. So you only get oil out of the little bit that you've cracked. So once you've, you've um, acidized or fracked and the, um, the oil is flowing, um, it flows well for the beginning and then the production runs down and down. So in, in the first year it runs down, whereas the production of a, an ordinary conventional oil well will, will carry on sort of fairly evenly for a long time because it's drawing over a large area. The difference here is that you will need a huge number of wells, wells every couple of miles, pads sometimes with six or or more potentially, Gator's pad is potentially 40, 60 wells on that one pad. You can drill out in all kinds of different directions in the same place. There will be flares, like for fracking. Mm -hmm. There will be a lot of traffic. There will be um, air pollution. There will be potential water pollution. Um, and there will be a lot of waste. And with fracking and with acidizing, particularly with fracking, but also with acidizing, there is, will be a lot of waste um, that is potentially radioactive because whatever you put down there, whatever chemicals, if you just put water, coming back would be a whole heap of stuff leached out from down under. So salt, saline waste, perhaps five times as saline as seawater, and salts of heavy metals and um, 
you know, no one knows where they're going to put this, no one knows how they're going to treat it, because if they treated it properly, it would blow the econ economics of the whole thing apart. The whole thing makes no sense anyway. The Conservatives just have this fracking fetish, there is absolutely no sense in it. So do help us spread the word, and um, I hand over to Jill to tell what me in the week. As we have, Chio who is coming next is a very experienced campaigner. She's not only a very experienced campaigner, she's also a very humble woman. And I would like us to really, really give her a round of applause and use that applause to bring her to the front to come and talk to us and share that experience with us. Jill. introduction. I'll see if I can live up to it. Right, a little bit about me first and then we'll cover a bit of what's going on in Sussex. A lot of people in Lancashire think nothing's happening in south of London but I can tell you there's a lot. Right, I was on the parish council when we got an application for an exploratory drill. I have no idea what that meant. That's four or five years ago. As I'm an environmental scientist I said to the rest of the council I'll find out and brief you. So I looked into it, and the more I looked into it, the more I thought, this isn't appropriate. We've got climate change. We need to move over, transition to uh, less harmful forms of energy. And why on earth are we spending more energy than we'll get out to get hard to get at bits of oil? It's the tail end, it's the fag end of the industry, isn't it? We've done the big stuff, almost, as a new find off Shetland. We've done the big pools. Oh, we'll keep going as an industry. It doesn't work. The economics don't add up. In America, uh, I think it's 135 fa uh, firms have gone bust in the last two years, and they've got a trillion worth, billion worth of uh, debt just on front. So don't be convinced about jobs or money. Right, that was a bit about me. We can go on then, perhaps. Right, and keep going. You'll have to, right. So that was my introduction. Now, language is very important. The N word has been ditched by the industry. They had a big conference in Australia. We've got some very, very um, innovative campaigners. One of our campaigners was out there, dressed up to the nines, went to the big industry conference and learned. They were saying, what can we do? The word fracking has become very toxic. We'll have to change scope. So that's where acidisation comes. Doesn't sound quite so awful, does it? <laughs> acidisation, and it's used to clean bore, well water wells and the bores in water wells. So you have to beware of a very, okay, well, I'll come on to that in a minute, come back to that in a minute. It's a very sort of soothing language these days. Fracking sounds quite fixed. Okay, we'll look at the wheel and the sites and the companies and what's happening in the future. Right, so this is just your conveyor. I don't know whether you're all familiar with this, are you? Okay. If you've got a drill and it goes down into a pool, that's conventional, either gas or oil. That's what, sorry, shall I move that away? Can you see? Um, that's conventional. So you've got a large pool and they can suck it up. If it goes down into something that's embedded within either shale or sandstone or limestone like we're hearing called tight. It's not freely available. It's like trying to take the raisins out of the Christmas pudding. You know, they're a bit scattered about. I don't know how you do it with an oil drill, but th there must be some way <laughs> cutting it up and shoving it through a sieve and keeping the raisins, right? That's what they've got. That's the problem they've got. So they think with their big glasses with pound notes on, that it's lots of money. It's actually using more energy to get at much smaller amounts. Right, can we go next one, thank you. Now, the difficulty these days is unconventional, is requires other characteristics. It, it requires a porosity, a permeability, and fluid traffic. That is, 
it doesn't move as easily as other forms of water or oil in the ground. So that means we have to stimulate it. This is either acidization with cathode distortion or fracking. That's just a form of stimulation as well. Let's try and get it done. And the other way is conventional reservoirs. In our county in Sussex, they're trying to sell us that it's conventional. We know it's unconventional. Okay? They approved an application at Broadford Bridge for conventional. They were assured it was all going to be conventional. We know it's not. We know it's unconventional. But they're trying to muddle up the language and the linguistics. Next one, thank you. And these are the development licenses, the petroleum exploration development licenses in Sussex and Surrey. Okay, the, the top ones are Brockham, Horse Hill, Holmwood, Godley Bridge of Surrey, and the ones at Broadford Bridge, Brockham and Baxter Scott. And also one missing Mark Wells Wood. I'll come back to that. Thank you. And and Isle of Wight. Not to get the Isle of Wight, the Isle of Wight's also. Right next. How many minutes did I have? <laughs> <laughs> All together. Right. Oh, hurry up. Right. Here's our uh, West Sussex. On we go. Next one. That's where the, the pedals, the trading exploration development licenses fit. Next one. Next one. Oh, here they come. Keep going. Keep, keep tapping the thing. The, the first one, Singleton, Storrington, Lidsey, are conventional wells. Stick a drill down, up it comes. The, and you get those nodding donkeys. Very comforting, isn't it? Oh, I've got a nodding donkey at the bottom of the arm. Not the animal, just a, a drill. So the other ones, Orkham, I'll come back to it in a minute, Orkham, Broadford Bridge and Markwell's Wood are all now for unconventional oil. Put in a drill and apply lots of chemicals and the waste water that you create, come, a lot stays in the ground, up to 60% can stay in the ground, but a lot comes back up that is very toxic and difficult to deal with. And actually, Sussex hasn't got somewhere to deal with. So we're going to ship it to Kent. I hope you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're alert to this. Okay. Next one, thank you. Sorry? Sorry? Next one, thank you. Next one, thank you. Sorry? I'm sorry. I can't apologise enough for Sussex's behaviour. <laughs> so this is the wheels. Okay. These, and what the argument is, is the oil is all under that area with the blue line. Other geologists... Um, uh, other part from the company say actually it isn't under all that the, there are gaps and there are places where it doesn't go. Next one. So the wheel is lying between those chalk escarpments of North and South Downs with three separate parts. Sandstone of the high wheel in the centre, the clay of the low wheel and the green sand. <coughs> and in the West Sussex landscape uh, characteristics and advice it says don't industrialise this area because it's so special. Okay, West Sussex, let's ignore it. Right, before we go. Uh, right, so who's drilling where? This is eye gas, familiar now. Uh, they're uh, drilling on these uh, sites or got plans. Next one. This is um, uh, Hill of Mark Wells Woods. Next one. Oh, it's a Storrington, thank you. And this shows that the way in which those drills can then go out from that main centre. So it's not just where the drill is. Next one. Grafham and West Dean. There was an old well there at Grafham, but they want to go there again. Next one. Here's the Angus, which is at Lidsey. Angus Energy is also at Brockham. You may have heard that the protectors come there spotted them working illegally at night and also that they were drilling a side well, much more risky, uh, without permission. And at the minute, Surrey County Council is in dispute with Angus Energy. Next one. Uh, Ritzy, this is their site at Ritzy. Next. Uh, vertical site and the, the Google map. Next one. That is a nodding dog in conventional at this Next one. Uh, this is Balkan, Quadrilla. Next one. So that was the drill, Quadrilla. And then the um, permission expired, didn't it, for any other tests at Balkan in May? Yes, but they're reapplied in September. Yeah, so that's still live. Next one. Newcock. Hmm. 
Right, so this is Crawford. Oh, 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 oh. Crawford <laughs> Bridge near Billingshurst, um, Mark Wood, uh, they've had to withdraw their application at Mark Wood for further discussions. Uh, lovely. Actually, it was objected to by the Environment Agency, Portsmouth and District Water and Southern Water, because like Kent, it sits on the aquifer, the main aquifer in the South Downs and the Chalk. Mm. Next one. Crawford Bridge. You have to hurry up. Keep going. Keep going. This is the site at the minute. They're just applying for permission to extend their um, planning permission because that expires on September the 15th. Next one. This is where they said they were going to drill, was further up and then uh, further down, sorry, and they're now drilling further up. Next one. So they changed a lot of what they said they were going to do five years ago. Next one. Horse Hill, sorry, which is the so-called gusher. They, they inflated what was going on there to get more investors. Next one. Come on, we have to keep <laughs> going. And these are the differences between the original EA permit that was granted five years ago and what they're actually doing now. But West Sussex decided it was the same thing, a hole in the ground. But what they're doing in the hole in the ground is very different. And we haven't got anywhere to take the wastewater. Next one, please. I just want to get to the end where it shows you this was the site near us which have gone off now but could come back in. This is a possible new site we've identified. Next one. There are lots of loopholes coming through the legislation and the planning to fast track it and the Conservative Manifesto, as you'll be aware, included making drilling permitted development. So you didn't have to talk to the planning authorities or to ordinary people. Okay? It's not there in the Queen's speech, but watch out for statutory instruments because that could come in. Come on again. They've changed the definition. Gay don't refer to fracking, but it's no longer been fracked, actually, it's pre -sort. It was fracking in 19, uh, 2011, but not anymore. It doesn't count. Next. Yes, we keep going. Keep going. This it. No, it's not that. Can you go one back? Sorry. One back. Yeah. Sorry. One back. It was the. It was the. Sorry. One back. Sorry. Right. That is what happens in Wyoming. It started with one one, and Australia will tell you the same. That was it. I, I've got lots of things to say. The research is lagging. They haven't got any knowledge of subsurface impacts. They haven't got knowledge about what to do with the wastewater. And there was a professor in Edinburgh, a CEO page one time, said this is all back to front. They're launching this without actually knowing what they're doing. So we have to watch it. And it's not the best way to put anything on. Sorry, I've got to keep on the that you know and she thought I was flattering her but she actually proved to us that she is very knowledgeable and she knew exactly what she's talking about and what does it for me is the way that she actually broke it down even you know that some people learn by pictures and that you were able to relate to a lot of us here so thank you for that um, there's gonna be a questions you know time session and we have some very knowledgeable people as well within the audience and they would give us two minutes of the input towards the end. Our next speaker is Philip. Philip Pearson, please let's give him a round of applause. Uh, well, good evening everybody. Uh, I'm, my name is Philip Pearson. I used to work at the TUC Trade Union Congress on energy and climate change for quite a few years. I met Barry on occasions. Um, and, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about what trade unions are generally thinking about uh, fracking, acidization, fracking. Um, I would like to talk a bit about the evidence of the, the unreliability of wells, the evidence from the United States, because it is available. Uh, and I'd like to talk a bit about deregulation. I met Catherine some years back, was it 12? No, 13 in Baltimore. I'm from Brighton, and when I read about what was going on in Baltimore, you know, having been a Boy Scout and camping, <laughs> in 
hiked when we were on the downs and absolutely loved that area. It was just like, I can't get down there, just something brought me to this. And on my first day, I met Catherine um, on, the, on the protest line, which had been going for a while by then, amazing experience. <coughs> And on my first day, I also met somebody who Catherine will know, who was the, um, we got talking, she had probably twin set and pearls, um, which, you know, uh, why are you here, she said to me, kind of realising I wasn't, you know, from the area. And I said, well, no, I'm from Brighton, it really worries me what's going on. Um, you know, this, this idea of not one drill, but, you know, a whole landscape uh, potentially being threatened. And, you know, still unsure at that point what the evidence is or you know, what was really going to happen. And um, she said, well, actually what I've really noticed since they started the test, started to get the equipment on the site and begin to start drilling, she said, um, the badger sets are empty and, the, you know, things are happening with bird populations around the world because the lights are on all the time. And I thought, yeah, okay, you know, I hadn't really thought about that. I'm kind of climate change, I'm carbon dioxide emissions, I'm methane gas, you know, all that global warming stuff. And she was speaking very locally about immediate experiences and so forth. Uh, I came back a, a week or ten days later, and I met the same woman, and I said, oh, you know, nice to see you again. She said, nice to see you, she said. Uh, so I said, how, you know, how are you? What have you been thinking about this? She said, do you know, it's the carbon dioxide emissions that is <laughs> And we got talking a bit further, and it's the gas, and it's the flaring, and she'd been reading about, 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 about fracking and its effects, and what it meant locally, and the traffic she was talking about. But more than that, she said, I'm secretary of the local conservative association. <laughs> Whoops. And, uh, you know, her MP was, what was his name? The guy who was in the cabinet office. Oh, uh, yes. Um, Francis Ward. Francis, Francis yes, Ward, that's the guy. She said, we've written to him. We've had replies, but no answers. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I think over a period of time, and maybe Catherine would, would recognise what, what I'm saying, that the, 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 the um, exposure to the truth changes minds and changes if you like, an approach to politics. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, I just think that, that it's through conversations with, pe with people that you may not necessarily think are your natural political allies, but the common ground is very powerful, isn't it? It's about looking at the evidence. And although we've now got in Michael Gove an environment secretary, who, <laughs> during, the, you know, during the election, during the European election campaign, was saying, isn't he one of those who said we don't need experts? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's Secretary of State for the Environment. When he was <coughs> Education Minister, was very happy to seek to withdraw climate change and environmental science from the curriculum. Yes. Yeah. And he yeah. had some success in that. And it's, uh, it's, um, it's deception, changing uh, the word fracking to acidization. It's, it's promoting ignorance by, by not letting primary school children who gobble up this kind of knowledge when they are, you know, when they, when they get there, not letting teachers teach what children need to know to be responsible citizens, to be aware citizens. You know, you think, you know, you think, what is the purpose of learning? What is the purpose of education? And it is about exactly this kind of experience that we're all facing with fracking. It is understanding it, it's talking about it, and with people that you don't necessarily have a regular affiliation with. So, um, from a trade union point of view, it, I don't know how many of you are in trade unions. Most Ooh, trade woo! <laughs> uh, all right, the, the Trade Union Congress, which is the annual, which is the overarching body for the UK's 55 trade unions, around 7 million trade unions in the country, its overall position, I'm glad to say, is the sceptic, it's the precautionary principle. It hasn't quite gone to moratorium or ban, but it's certainly gone to the uh, precautionary principle, don't do it unless proven safe. Uh, and that was, I think, around 2012, the same year as I 
um, was done at Portland. But there are some trade unions who don't quite see it that way. The, the, for me, the one that I have the most problem with is called the GMB trade union. Uh, and they, you see, the kind of problem is that they've got 20,000 members in the gas industry. They are gas fitters, they are in North Sea oil, they are in um, the chemical industry, they, you know, they are in the gas production, distribution, supply, core centers. It's, it's a big problem for them. You know, it's, it's not as a simple story as we may wish them to convey. You know, they, they have direct members' interests, and I suppose the thing that I find frustrating, and some, a lot of people in trade unions find frustrating about such a position, it's not that you don't understand it, because that's an awful lot of workers' jobs in skilled, unionised jobs with pensions. Not, not the Uber economy, not the gig economy, not zero hours contracts, not many of them anyway. These are well-paid, secure jobs for people who, you know, put their life working for it or trained into those industries. So you need to kind of respect the position they're in, I think, because it's this thing about speaking and conversing. And, but, when you hear they them say, Britain's going to need gas for 30 years, you know, this is how you eat your homes and cook your food, you kind of think, Britain doesn't need gas for 30 years, Britain needs to think. Unions need to think about what the next 30 years will look like and what that thinking leads you to. A, about environmental issues and B, about the jobs that are needed to replace the ones that are doomed or the time limited. Look at the age profile of the workers, think about their retraining, and do the one thing that really successive governments have failed to properly do in Britain, which is to invest in these other industries. These people have got skills that can be used in other ways, converting gas cookers and, and um, domestic heating systems to, through to hydrogen supply, or maybe biogas, and thinking of the alternatives. So not like telling them they're wrong, just trying to persuade people that there are other ways of being, of working, and if we don't change, then really we are faced with climate change. Um, just a couple of other points. Uh, on the, uh, on the Jill's last point, really, about the, just thinking about that map of Wyoming, which I saw on the website, you know, about two years ago, you can also, I was so shocked actually to see a whole landscape made up of roads leading to wells. And you think, bloody hell. You know, and I'm sorry, but this is what could, this is what they want to see actually. So the, there isn't very much evidence of, you know, kind of leakage and stuff in the UK. So we don't have that many wells in the UK. In, yeah. No. And we won't either, will we? But in Wyoming, in, uh, in the Marcellus Shale, there is evidence from, and it's difficult to get because the data is kept by the gas companies, there is evidence from one study of 8,000 wells that 7 or 8 percent leaked into the water table. Now, 7 or 8 percent, but that is a vast amount of water because you know that is, that is hundreds of wells leaking. And you know we're talking about billions of gallons of, of impure water, either that was put down with its biocides and its lubricants and its acids, or that wells up, as Jim was saying, with the pollutants that are contained therein. And there's a second study which shows, in, in a different part of Pennsylvania, similar number of wells, you know, thousands and thousands of wells drilled. This is industrialized shale transforming American's energy economy. We're importing that shale now to Ineos in Grangeville. A side story which we may need to think about when we come to it. So, you know, there is evidence it's in the US and we need to be much more aware of it and be quoting it to these planners. The, the final thing is this question about deregulation. I don't, I don't know where the barriers can touch on this at all, but, you know, okay, I mean, so Grenfell Tower and you know the the fast and loose stuff with safety standards and whatever. You know, a ten year project across the Cameron government and the coalition, and a little bit under Labour it must be said, but principally under the 
Conservative-led coalition, there was this bonfire of regulations. Two out, one in. You know, that's it. If you're going to, if you want a new control on something, you've got, you've got to get rid of two. Health and Safety Executive, which oversees the inspectors, has had its staffing cut by a very, very large percentage. So that there are very, very few staff policing this area of the environment. Inspectors have been cut. Capacity has been reduced. The presumption is you don't go in. There is self-policing allowed in the regulations. And all of this, to me, sets us up for something to go wrong. Okay? Uh, I just, you know, who knows what? And I think that is the kind of warning that comes out of all of this, that things go badly wrong. Just read the literature about Australia, about America, about health impacts, about cancers, about people settling for, you know, multi-million pound health settlements between um, American citizens and the company so that there is no disclosure. And this is the kind of culture that we need to be very aware of. But the danger is, isn't it, that something will go wrong, small, medium or large. And in that you worry about the trade union attitude that thinks we could have protect the jobs. But those jobs themselves are far from being safe for us. And with the worries about the deregulation of health and safety, I worry too um, that there is that bit of short-sightedness, which also is a bit short-sighted short on the kind of working conditions that we are expecting those drivers, those drillers, those silica dust handlers, those chemical handlers to go into. It's not a job that we should be creating. It's the kind of job we should be creating. So I've run through quite a few issues, um, and you know, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Philip Pearson, thank you so much. Softly spoken, but the points are out there, and I'm quite sure that you know when we take that on board, we know exactly what we need to do. We need to make sure that the right people are in the government Yay. so that the right things can be in place. We need to go out there because we are the representative of our you know, community. We are the ambassadors okay. of our community. We need to go out there, recruit more ambassadors and kick the Tories out. And that's what we're going to do. Our next speaker is not a stranger to us. <laughs> it's one of our own. A lovely, hard-working, enthusiastic and passionate about the Labour Party. Let's welcome our own Vince Mento! Good evening friends and I want to say a special welcome to those of you who aren't in the Labour Party yet. Um, I know there are some in the room and, and let me let me firstly quote from my favourite little red book. I'm going to quote you from page 21. I'm going to quote you uh, four words and those four words are Labour will ban fracking. That's, that's what I'm going to do. And, and I'm going to do this all for my five minutes but I did love this. I missed this book from a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, and why is that important? It's important for all the reasons you've heard already and, and more reasons you'll hear from our excellent headline act. Uh, it's a bit like Glastonbury, but... <laughs> um, and actually, during the election, here's the thing, this election we had a, a few weeks back uh, was called for um, one simple reason, that we were supposed to have a strong and stable government. Well, that's kind of fallen to the wayside. But what was, and of course it was all going to be about Brexit. But the reality is, and many people in this room know, because I know many people in this room were knocking on doors in this constituency and in Maidstone and in Rochester and in Gillingham and Canterbury where we have our first female Labour MP for oh, yeah. 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 We know that the public said, well, well that might be what you thought the election was going to be about, but actually it's going to be about pretty much everything else. So it's going to be about the NHS, it's going to be about education and the dramatic cats that the uh, uh, the uh, NUT in particular have done so well at highlighting. It's going to be about our environment. Uh, and um, what, one thing that worries me, uh, lots of things worry me about Donald Trump, but one thing that worries me in particular 
it is his flagrant disregard for a fact. You know, he's a man who talks about you know fake news. He's got fake facts going on left, right, and centre. Got fake everything. And, well, and there's other fake things, but we won't talk about. That. <laughs> you might send me a tweet. I don't know. <laughs> um, but the reality is, we know from speaking to people on the doorstep, they are worried about the future of our, the, our, both the country, but also our planet. And uh, we've heard tonight from people who've got far much more knowledge than I uh, around these particular issues. What I know is this: uh, if someone says to you, actually. Uh, you've got the ability to perhaps make a few pounds for your parish council. Uh, don't, don't, worry about, don't worry about your environment or actually what's going to happen to your housing or your water supply. Here's a few extra pounds. The great British public will go, you're having a laugh, basically. The great British public will go, well actually tell us what you're going to do to our community. And we know that because that's exactly what happened in Balcombe. That's exactly what's happened in various places up, up in the northwest, And that will continue to be... Uh, what happens. And, and let's be really, really clear. If William Shakespeare, I'm going to paraphrase William Shakespeare because it's Monday night and that's what you should do when you're amongst <laughs> friends. Uh, a rose by any other name is still a rose. Fracking by any other name is still fracking. Um, we need to be clear. Send this message loud and clear. They can kiss my Acidization. <laughs> Kiss my acidization. That's not going to be happening because we're going to be having people in this room and, and people who are not in this room tonight who would want to be uh, sending a loud message to say, actually, we stand in solidarity in the Labour Party. Those of you who are not in the Labour Party yet, um, we use the word solidarity a lot, and it means a lot to me. You know, I had 51 days of huge amounts of solidarity by many people in this room. But actually, we send solidarity to those who are standing up for their community, saying we're not going to let uh, a pound, shillings and pence uh, get in the way of you know, having a future for our community. That's not acceptable. That's not how we roll. So we send that solidarity uh, to those communities, whether they're just over the uh, county border. And thanks for giving us the warning you might be sending stuff our way. We're ready with a pretty strong message from this room, I'm sure. But also to colleagues in the northwest and elsewhere, because actually we need to stand united. We have a Labour Party now more than ever who cares about the environment, who cares about actually making sure we have a planet to hand on to our next generation. And you'll be hearing from our excellent keynote speaker a lot more detail about that. Someone who. Uh, uh, there'll be many selfies, I'm sure, at the end of the night. Don't worry about that. that won't be, uh, uh, we won't be powering anything with the phones after, so I'm sure. <laughs> but, but actually, we've got to make sure that we send a message that, yes, we will continue to say the clear messages on the health service and on education and on our infrastructure. The, the public would expect us to do that. But the public also wants to make sure that they've got representatives, whether it's representatives on town and parish councils, which is quite often where the first place... These, these planning applications will be seen by people, and we, I know we've got lots of people who will be standing up for that in the next couple of years. Whether we've got excellent people standing up at Borough and Unitary Authority or KCC, or whether we've got a brilliant PLP, more united than ever before, that's what we all want to see, and I'm sure Barry will take that message back from all of us, that it's quite good that this is the only meeting on a Monday night I'm talking about this week, thank goodness. Um, other meetings are probably available. Um, but actually, we're going to be standing up for our community. So if they come knocking on our door, if they come saying, actually, this will make our community better, this will be better for where we are. And we've seen this uh, in the past. We've seen that in our communities elsewhere. We need to stand up and say, United, actually, uh, this is not for us. This is not for the British people. And why is that the case? Because we've seen the evidence so starkly from, from our international friends who have suffered this, who have suffered uh, their health deteriorating, their communities not existing anymore. Literally, as we've seen, they're being wiped out by this uh, situation which, frankly, is greed. There's no other word for it. It's greed. Uh, and let me say this as a GMB member, I'm really clear, I want GMB members to be working on the clean energy of the future. And I hope Tim Roach and the, the other leadership of my union listens to that loud and clear. I want to protect jobs, but I want there to be jobs on a planet that still exists, frankly. There's no point in having jobs if you are having a situation uh, where that's the case. And the final point I'll say is this, because I'm trying to catch up on time, because um, I want to make sure that I get the train. Um, uh, the final point I say is this, there are lots of people in this room 
uh, and I know people like Jill, people like Sue, wherever she is, uh, lots of people have done tremendous work. One of the things we've had a real pressure on here in, in Kent and Medway is the issue with refugees. You know, be under no illusion that actually the compassion shown by this people in this room uh, is a thousandfold compared to the people currently running our, our government. But, and here's the thing that I think needs to be looked at carefully, uh, the numbers we've seen, uh, people who are moving across the planet because of war or conflict will pale into insignificance, will be a footnote compared to those who may be affected if we don't get it right on the issue of climate change. So we want to stand loud and clear and say, actually, we're not just doing this for self-interest here in Kent or in the south of England or for the UK. We're doing this because we want to make sure, actually, that for all parts of our planet, we don't end up in a situation where through political choices, because this is ultimately what these are, political choices, we have a situation where the refugee crisis of the 2010s it is like small fry compared to where we end up in 20, 30, 50 years' time. So I want to thank you for being here today. Uh, thank you particularly again, like I say, for those who are not in the Labour Party yet. Uh, and, and look, this is a message we send loud and clear from this meeting. that people have gathered, we've got a room full of people uh, in Aylesford sending the message that actually the environment is important to the Labour Party, climate change is important to the Labour Party, and we go back to that message on page 21, Labour will ban fracking. Thanks for being here. to come back out. Um, but before I, I do that, when somebody comes knocking on my door or knocking on your door to say fracking is good for us, I know what I'll be telling them, he's my acidization. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to bring <laughs> I'm going to bring Vince back to come and introduce our special guest tonight. I would, you know, when it comes out, just let's give him the honor that he's doing. Let's just rise on our feet and really appreciate this, this man, this gorgeous man sitting here, who I'll be taking a selfie with later on. <laughs> I, I, I know, I'm the only person who wasn't called gorgeous tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, let, let, let me say this. We are, we are incredibly lucky to have a Shadow Secretary of State with us tonight. Uh, There'll be some people in this room who watch the daily politics, I think, probably. Uh, and, and sometimes, um, dare I say it, when we have Labour representatives on there sometimes, I, I cringe a bit. There's one man, when I see him on my TV, I know we are in absolute, not only safe hands, but the Labour message will be loud, will be clear, and will convince voters who they need to be representing them. So we are really, really proud here in Chatham Lale to welcome our keynote speaker, Mr. Barry Gardner. Two weeks and we'd had our first oral questions in Parliament. They published the department. <laughs> <laughs> and then we came to party conference and it was my privilege at party conference to change our party policy, to use those four words, Labour will ban fracking. I want to explain to you why. Because before, our policy was different. 
Our policy before that was that we would put a moratorium, we would have a moratorium on fracking, but we wouldn't ban it. And in fact, we had had something called the Infrastructure Bill in Parliament, uh, which had been earlier that year, in January of that year. And we put 13 amendments down on the Infrastructure Bill. Amendments about fracking which were the environmental safeguards that we thought had to be in place before you could say that fracking would be safe to proceed. And we thought they were pretty tough tests, and indeed they were. We got in the Lords, the government decided that they would say that they would accept those tests, but they would introduce them in their own way, back in the Commons. And then they reneged on those promises. They did not accept those tests, and they modified other, others. They even changed definitions of, of water protection zones and the water protection areas, um, so that actually it wouldn't apply. Um, and we had a series of tests, and we said, look, these tests, they may not be able to be met, but technology moves on. Maybe they can be met. And if they can be met, then the argument about doing this in a way that is safe for the environment goes, and therefore we could not ban fracking. So what changed? Technically, nothing. Technically, it might still be possible to actually frack safely if a whole load of parameters were put in place and a whole load of safeguards were put in place. What changed was the world. It was the Paris Climate Agreement. It was the fact that 195 countries around the world came together and said, you know what? We will agree. We will agree that by the second half of this century, we will reduce the rise in emissions from pre-industrial level to below 2 degrees and as close to 1.5 degrees as possible. Now, once you've set that as your goal and the countries of the world have actually ratified it and critically, what happened last year was that China and America did ratify it, <laughs> pre-Trump, <laughs> then it wasn't about, is it safe for your community? It wasn't about what's going to happen to your water table. It wasn't about the 7 to 8% of pluming and, and, and emissions that Phil was talking about that they measured in the US. I mean, the Committee on Climate Change here says that actually, you've got to have no more than 3% emissions, otherwise all the things that you think you're saving by using gas instead of coal have gone out the window anyway. No, it wasn't about that anymore. It was about how do we get to net zero in the second half of this century? Because net zero is where the world wants to get to in terms of its emissions. Because that's the way that we're going to avoid exactly what Vince was talking about, the wholesale climate dislocation in our planet, which means not just refugees, it means that the whole shift in agriculture and desertification, it means all the uh, deforestation, it's all the other things, the acidification of the oceans, all the other things that go with climate change are going to make it very difficult for people like us, or for people, I should say, to live on this planet. And therefore, if that is your objective, what you've got to do is make sure that you are on a trajectory to get to your objective. So let's look at what Labour did in government in 2008. We set in place the Climate Change Act. Groundbreaking piece of legislation. Fantastic piece of legislation. It's a piece of legislation that is, is being copied all around the world because it set the first legally binding framework that said what we will do is we will set a long-term goal, which is, was in those days our 2050 goal, for at least 
an 80% reduction in emissions by 2050. And what we'll do is we will also set short-term objectives. There's no point in having a, a long-term goal. Politicians don't work in long term. You may have noticed, but politicians, <laughs> politicians tend to work in promises that, well, if you're the Tory government, last for four days in the election. <laughs> but, but at best, you know, four years. And actually, if you look at what's happening in the financial world, Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, who set up the Financial Stability Board and the, uh, the task force for um, investigating the way in which climate change impacts on financial stability, he says exactly the same thing. The short termism isn't just political, it's also economic, because the return on capital, the way in which the financial markets operate, is also within that short term. And that's why he says he's worried about climate change. Because actually the financial instability that can come from climate change <coughs> can absolutely rock away all our pension funds. Mm. Absolutely rock away. Because there's something called stranded assets. You know, if, if, you, if you see your investment go into uh, an oil and gas company, and yet the International Energy Agency, Fatty Burrell, who produces this every year, the International Energy Agency says, actually, we already have identified five times the oil and gas reserves that would bust through five times more than we need to bust through the two degree targets. And you've got to ask the question, why are we looking for further reserves? We know, what, we know we've already got more than enough to destroy the planet. But then you ask the question, well, what does that do to the shares of those companies? Those companies are overvalued. Because in, in their valuation, in their stock market valuation, actually, are those five times too much reserves? Now, if you can't burn them, you can't sell them. And if you can't sell them, they're not actually an asset. So it's, it's not just environmentalists, right? It's not just those of us who, you know, who care about the environment and the landscape. It's actually the financial markets. It's all about our pensions. It's about all of those things together. So, the reason that we took the decision that we had to move from a moratorium to banning fracking was because we know that yes, gas will be important in the short to medium term in this country. And if you listen to the Committee on Climate Change, the Committee on Climate Change says that up to 2030, gas will be an important element of the mix of our power sector because actually we need it for the intermittency that renewables have. Sun doesn't shine all the time, the wind doesn't blow all the time, mm. and we need backup storage, and we need to put those storage facilities in place, and we need batteries, battery storage, and so on. So gas will be important up to 2030. And the reason I say the Committee on Climate Change did this, because what, what the Act of 2008 did was it didn't just set those targets and those short-term budgets, it set an independent body called the Committee on Climate Change that would set, that would recommend those five-year budgets of how much carbon emissions we could afford if we wanted to be on the least cost trajectory to achieve our long-term goal. And that's important, least cost trajectory. Because this is not about environment at any price. This is actually about doing what is economically sensible to get to where we need to be. And that least cost trajectory is the way in which the Committee on Climate Change maps it out. And they've said, the third carbon budget accepted that, the government has now accepted the fourth carbon budget and the fifth carbon budget that will take us up to 2032. The only trouble is, the act that we passed in 2008 also says that the government has to not just set the budget, it also has to publish an implementation plan as to how it is going to achieve the budget. And I'm afraid that the last implementation plan has been 
has been outstanding since July 2011. Ooh. They promised it. They promised it. And they keep on promising. And it was, oh, don't worry, we'll publish the, an implementation plan when we publish the fifth, when we set the fifth carbon budget, they said. Well, they set the fifth carbon budget 19 days late last July. And they still didn't publish it. And what they said is, well, we'll publish it before Christmas. Then they said they'd publish it in the new year. Then they said they'd publish it in March. Now they'll say they're going to publish it after the summer recess. So gradually what the government is doing is destroying our capacity to deliver on the budgets that we have actually set into law because it's refusing to show the steps that are needed to be taken to do that. So let me come back to Frank. The Committee on Climate Change has said that after 2030, there needs to be a rapid decline in the use of gas in this country all the way down to 2050. So the reason we took the decision last year to ban fracking is because it makes no economic sense to lock ourselves in for the long term to an outmoded, outdated fossil fuel technology. When what we need to be doing is encouraging investment in a low carbon, zero carbon future. Ooh. You know, I used to I used to be in business. Didn't take much notice of politicians when I was in business. But I used to get pissed off if they changed the rules. You know? I got used to doing things one way, and suddenly they changed the rules. And what business constantly asks of government, doesn't, they don't really mind what the rules are, just tell us, be clear about them, set them for the long term, and then don't piss about with them. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason that I took the decision that we had to ban from is actually not because I want to be nasty to business. It's not because I want to, you know, have companies making investments that, that, that aren't going to produce anything. It's actually because I want to be straight with business. That if you are going to make this investment, do so in full knowledge that a, an incoming Labour government will ban fracking. That's fair. Nobody can come in and say, oh, well, you know what, nobody told us about this and therefore you can't go back on it. No, no, we've told you. We've told you exactly what we're going to do. And what we're doing now is we're trying to influence your policy as investors to make sure that instead of spending millions of pounds invested in fracking, investing in a technology that is going to be outdated, we want you to invest in the things that we need and to make them cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Because that's what happens. The first investments, it's tougher. But as the technology goes on, it becomes cheaper and cheaper to have renewable really technology, battery technology, and the modernization of the grid. So I want to address a few key issues that people say about fracking, about shell gas. And one is that actually, if you look at America, this has enabled this transformation of an American economy that has come about from shale gas. It's managed to actually reduce emissions in America. You're shaking your head at the back of the room. It didn't. In fact, it did. It did. Because what happened was, America was using a heck of a lot of coal. But what's happened is that that coal that they were using, that they're now not using, what have they done with it? Have they stopped producing coal? No. What they did with that coal is they exported it to Europe. Subsidized, incredibly subsidized to Europe, to sell into the European market very cheaply. Actually, it was just about at the time 
Germany took the decision to stop its nuclear program. And it needed more base load, and they consumed a heck of a lot of coal as a result of stopping the nuclear program. So their emissions actually um, went up. So it's true to say that in America that happened. The climate didn't benefit, that coal was still getting burned, and unfortunately, we all live in the same climate and the same atmosphere, and, and climate change patterns, whether you actually burn that coal in America, or whether you burn it in Germany. So there's no global benefit, but it's true to say there was a benefit to the US economy, and it's true to say that their emissions at that time did come down. That won't happen in Britain. And one of the, the big myths about shale gas is that shale gas is going to allow us to produce less emissions because we can use shale gas to replace coal. Nonsense. Coal was already coming off the system through the uh, power directive. The coal was coming off the system by 2023 and now at the latest by 2025. Actually, Amber Rudd was a, was a master stroke, or a mystery stroke, when she was uh, Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, because what she did was she managed to announce an extension by two years of the date when coal would already come off the system, which was 2023, uh, she managed to announce that extension as if it were her taking the decision uh, to cut coal out of the system. It was done so that she could go to the, uh, the UNFCCC COP, climate change conference uh, and say, look at Britain, we've banned coal. Well, actually, it's coming off the system now. Mm. And because it's coming off the system now, the idea that shale gas is actually going to save us those emissions between gas and coal is absolutely nonsense. Um, the other thing is that it's cheap. People say, well, look, this is a form of, 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 of cheap energy. We should, be, we should be grabbing this with both hands. Well, um, let me just read to you what our Committee on Climate Change said. I mean, after all, these are our independent experts. They're there to advise us on this. And they put a power sector scenario for the fifth carbon budget. Sorry, that sounds a bit boring, but actually this bit isn't very boring. In a central scenario for gas prices, and with a value attached to carbon that is consistent with meeting the UK's 2050 target, remember, that 2050 target is only an 80%, at least 80% reduction on 1990 levels, and we need to go much further than that. The full cost of new gas generation would be £85 per megawatt hour for new plants coming online in 2020, and £95 pounds per megawatt hour for 2025. Mature renewables are already demonstrating that they can provide electricity at a lower lifetime cost, implying they will effectively be subsidy free by 2020. So these are the independent experts who advise the government. And what they said is actually, you are going to be cheaper producing renewable energy than going down this gas route. So the question you've got to ask is, why is it then that George Osborne, God bless him, when he was still Chancellor, announced what he proudly said was the, uh, the best subsidy regime anywhere in the world for shale gas? 75% capital allowances, right? It may not be costing them very much, but it's costing us as yes. the taxpayer 75% capital allowances. It's obscene. 75% capital allowances for a, an energy form that we have been told by our independent experts is actually more costly than renewables. Crazy. And if you want to look at the tax regime, actually shale gas, he has given a tax, uh, tax on 
uh, on the shale gas is 30% as opposed to in other sectors of the oil and gas industry 62% or if you go to the old fields in the North Sea 81% tax levels. So this is, this is a huge amount of public subsidy being shoveled into an area of energy production surplus to what the world needs more expensive than we could be providing for ourselves elsewhere. And with just a few environmental problems that some of our previous speakers have raised, <laughs> which still have not technically been resolved. So let's talk about jobs. And, and Phil, I was, I was really, really grateful to you for the way in which you made your presentation. And, and because it's very difficult to come before an audience like yourselves who are, you know, absolutely opposed to fracking and to say, but look, we have to consider that there are our fellow citizens whose jobs, whose livelihoods, whose family incomes depend on the jobs that are in the fossil fuel industry. And that is absolutely right. That's why, and I'm a member of GMB too, folks. Um, that's why the GMB is, is desperately worried about this situation. And, and Gary Smith, who's, who's their, um, you know, one, one of their uh, key people in, in, in the sector, um, he's spoken of 64,000 possible jobs in the fracking industry. Well, actually, if you look at the projections that Quadrilla made um, for Lancashire, they said that there would be 1,700 jobs created in Lancashire as a result of fracking industry. Um, what they didn't actually bother to tell people is that that was in year one, and that within three years, those jobs fell to 200. And what they didn't tell us was that in the field that uh, I think it was Vince mentioned and, and possibly Jill as well, the Marcellus field in the United States, um, the overestimation of the number of jobs in the US fracking industry was seven times. They projected seven times the number of jobs that actually eventually resulted. But jobs are jobs. And if we're talking 64,000 potential jobs, exactly as Bill said, what we've got to do is not just say, oh, well, that doesn't matter. What we've got to do is we've got to be able to present our fellow citizens with a vision of how we transition from the jobs of the present to the jobs of the future. And that's the point here. This, is, this isn't a, a, you know, us versus them. You know, those people who work in this terrible industry, you know, otherwise you can, you can go back, you know, and all the time you would side with Ned Ludd, <laughs> you know. Um, society does change, society does move, employment changes, employment moves on. <laughs> and we in the labor movement have to be at the forefront of seeing what we can create as a better future. And that's why when I said those four words on the platform at the Labour Party conference in year ago, I also announced a program of energy efficiency and retrofitting and, uh, and a new energy grid structure, which would actually create 300,000 jobs. Not potential jobs, real jobs, good jobs. Jobs that were actually making that transition from the industry of the past, the energy industries of the past, to the energy industries of the future. And that's what we have to do. And actually, there is only the Labour Party that can do that. Because it's only in the Labour Party that we are so intrinsically linked with the Labour movement and the trade union movement that we can make these arguments resonate. We can, we can enable people to see that through the apprenticeships that we create, through the, the, the new investment that we make in the industries of the future, 
we can actually enable to people to make that transition in their own work. Um, so, energy efficiency. Um, we could actually reduce by 26% by 26% our use of gas in this country by 2030, simply through an energy efficiency. Um, we have um, 96,000 low carbon companies, companies that are involved in low carbon industries, the energy industries of the future in this country. And they generate 46.2 billion pounds for our economy. That's what we need to grow. And I want, want to close by going back to the last December to the UNFCCC COP that took place in Marrakesh. And I made one reference previously to Donald Trump, and here I will make another. I sat down with a guy called Jonathan Pershing, known for many years. He's been the climate uh, special climate envoy for Obama for the past eight years and before that. Um, one of the most knowledgeable people in, on the whole issue of energy and climate change that you could possibly find. And this was what it must have been a few days after Donald Trump had been elected, but of course before he became president. And I said to John, I said, God, you must just be so devastated. You know, what is this man going to do? Is he, is he, is he going to take the U.S. out of the Paris Agreement? Is he, uh, you know, is he going to withdraw from the UNFCCC? You know, the EPA program, um, uh, which is their federal program in the United States to, to combat emissions and pollution, um, you know, is going to be ripped up. And he said, no, no. He said, I'm not the person at all. And he looked at him as if he was crazy. I mean, this is the man who had invested, you know, over a decade of his life in achieving the Paris Agreement and, and, and moving America forward. And I, I couldn't understand what he was saying. He said, no, he said, Barry, what you've got to understand is that, yeah, you're right, Trump will probably shred the EPA program. Whether or not he actually comes out of the Paris Agreement, I don't know, but he certainly won't fulfill the objectives of it and you know there'll be no money going into But it's not down to him now. Point is this that business in America knows where the future is. The cities, the states, they are the ones who are now driving this. And business is driving it and business is putting in the investment. And he said, you know the really interesting thing is if you look at those coal states that Trump was appealing to Go to all those coal states, and you will find that there are more jobs in wind power in those coal states than there are in coal. So, I want to give you that hope. Um, because all of this has to be seen in this context. It's the future that we want. It's the future that we create. We have the capacity to move in this incredible transition that we happen to be living on the cusp of, where we have five times more fossil fuels than we can possibly burn. We have to leave 80% of them in the ground, even if we're just to achieve the two degree agenda. And by the second half of this century, we need to be, by the end of that second half of the century, we need to be in the net zero carbon emissions well, That's the only way of stopping the sort of the cataclysms that Vince alluded to. And there will be wholesale movement of people. We already see what's happening with climate change. Climate change is a fact. It's with if anybody asks me if I believe in climate change, I say no. I don't believe in climate change. You know, there's no point of believe, you know, I, I might believe in God, I don't believe in climate change. I know that climate change exists. I know that it's happening. It's happening now. And this is one of the ways in which we are tackling under
Labour government, we will ban We love you, Barry. Yes. And, and most of most of the shadow cabinet. Yes. <laughs> what do you mean, Stop. most of them? All of them. <laughs> All of them. Yes. Thank you so much, Barry. Um, that was really explanatory, factual, and we need to run with it. And basically, have the assurance that Labour Party has got it covered. Yes. So <laughs> we are going to question and answer, you know, session, um, and before we dive into that, we got like capable speaker in the audience who I would like to invite to just give us two minutes. Why I call the person to give us two minutes of what they think about what is going on at the moment. If you have your question, think it through in your head because you've only got one minute to ask your question and one minute to get your answer back because we are very conscious of time. We have so much to do before Barry runs off for, for, you know, for his train. So, I'm going to ask um, my beautiful lady Julie to please, you know, rise on your feet and basically just give us two minutes Okay, thank you very much. Support. Thank you very much everybody and thank you so much for coming on this really important issue. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Julie Wassman. Um, I'm from the campaign group East Kent Against Fracking. And in 2013, we fought a very fierce campaign against fracking in East Kent against the company Coastal Oil and Gas Limited. But we did so um, alongside um, this gentleman here, Graham Warren. He is a very respected hydrogeologist who worked for almost 30 years for the Environment Agency. And his evidence was crucial in showing that the drilling and possible fracking at the, those sites um, could possibly risk the irreversible contamination of the chalk aquifer. That is the aquifer that serves up to 90% of our country with its water. So it would be wholly wrong to, for people to believe that those of us who oppose fracking are just a bunch of irrational eco-freaks. That is what David Cameron tried to put out, and it simply isn't true, because... There are now well over 500 residence groups in the UK. Frack Free Sussex alone has over 10,000 followers. That gives you an indication of the size of opposition to this industry. And it's a rightful opposition to this industry. Um, I'll be quick because I don't have very long, but basically, you know, I've done media interviews. I was a press officer at East Kent Against Fracking. Um, and a radio interviewer once said to me, you're just bashing the government. And I said, I'm criticising the government because fracking is government policy. You cannot separate fracking from politics. They are inextricably linked. And quite honestly, this government has promoted nepotistic relations with key members in this industry. Do you think we could possibly have received the truth on fracking when Lord John Brown, the former head of BP, was actually made an unelected member of the Cabinet when he was the chairman of the fracking firm Quadrilla. This is what we're up against. Now, the, the government also has pursued a dishonest framing campaign about fracking um, and a policy at odds with the evidence on UK climate law and the incontrovertible harm that has been caused to communities elsewhere. You only have to look at what has happened in America. In America, if the government didn't expect that there would be water contamination from this toxic industry, why do you think that they exempted the fracking companies from something called the Safe Drinking Water Act in 2005? That sent anybody in Pennsylvania whose water was contaminated directly to those companies, and the first part of any compensation deal was the signing of a non-disclosure agreement by those families or farmers, and, and though, those often included children of seven years old having to agree never to speak about fracking ever again or the Marcella yeah. Shell. So I'm just saying to you very quickly, please mobilize. When you go home tonight, don't just think it's all, it's all licked. 
please go home because you're all part of the solution and look up for yourself the list of the harmed, the people who were harmed in the Pennsylvania. Look up sites like Fracking Hell or Fracking Hell UK on Facebook and really arm yourself with the facts. It's really not that difficult. As Gazer always says, when Quadrilla have top PR companies like Bell Pottinger working for them, we only have the truth. But we fought a very, very strong battle against this industry. We'll do brilliant. it together, and we brilliant. do it with the truth. So please check this out for yourself. And this is Graham Warren here, the hydrogeologist that helped us fight fracking in Kent. of our time, if your question is taking too long, I'm going to ask you to write it down and then we'll answer you via email. But if you have any question, please signify. I've got one person already on that side. That's two. Okay. Three. Anybody else? Four. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> I've got a minute. This is all men dominated. What's going on with the women? Do we not have any questions? I have questions, but I'm not going to ask because I've been talking. Okay. Matthew, thank you so much okay. for um, what you did for us today. Please ask your question. Um, shall I stand up? Or, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can yeah. Do um, Barry, you mentioned a minute ago that 75% uh, capital allowances for shell expansion. Um, do you know how much this will be per year? And is there a projected amount by 2020 of tax that is generated from the country that's going towards propping up the shale gas industry? Next question from that gentleman. Yes, my name is Steve Wilkins, I'm the Secretary of Midway Trade Council. I'm also actually, like Philip, a member of the Campaign Against Climate Change Trade Union Group. And uh, Philip didn't get a lot of time, so he didn't get a chance to talk about the million climate jobs and just transition, which is directly addressing this question about how do you get people who are working in fossil fuel industries uh, to, to be moved over. Because there's one, there's, there's one alternative to just transition, and that's unjust transition, which a lot of workers actually get, which is suddenly the company says, sorry, we're not doing this anymore, you're out on the dole, and we want something wrong with that. Um, here. Yeah, okay. Um, so, speaking about the environment a little bit more broadly, uh, our policy towards the environment a bit more broadly, um, I wrote a motion which was uh, eventually passed at South East Labour Conference uh, with regards to housing um, and the idea was that with the environment we need to make it not something that's abstract but we need to um, integrate it into the problems of everyday life um, including with housing um, and the idea was that you can now build houses which are um, not just zero carbon but what we call energy positive which means that they actually generate more energy than they use and the excess goes into the, the national grid. Um, essentially eco-council housing. Um, what does Barry think about that suggestion um, and does he agree with it? Thank you. The last question is from this side. Because there was... Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is a bit of a technical question really. One of the speakers, I can't remember which one, said the waste from Bolton was going to come to Kent to be... To be waste from Sussex. Yeah. yeah. It's a technical question because the Kent County Council are the waste authority. So they would, they would have to apply for a licence to bring this waste matter into Kent. And I wired the advice out, wherever the fracking is done, the said County Council will have to do a licence well, the waste materials, have there been any licenses issued? And if there have, how are they dealing with this waste? No. It's a quick answer. No? <laughs> <laughs> We're not having that and, and, and I'll raise, I'm seeing the, lead, the Labour group leader tomorrow morning when I get to uh, uh, have breakfast with him in Birmingham at local government association. And Dar, if you're online, hello. Uh, I will raise this with him to make sure he's aware that this is something we need to look at. We, we've got not as big a Labour group on KCC as we would like, uh, but we will ensure that they're certainly aware of that. So, very good point. Okay, over to you, Barry, to answer those questions. Um, <laughs> Matthew, on the 75% capital allowances, um, my understanding is that 
Um, we can't give you a figure on that because we don't know how many licenses are going to be granted going forward. So it, it will depend on what licenses are granted, what investment is put in, as to then what the, the capital allowances that companies are able to claim are. Uh, and therefore, you, you'd only get the figures retrospectively rather than prospectively. Um, you could make an educated guess uh, about the number of licenses that, uh, that will be granted um, under this government, but it would, it would be no, no more than that. Um, on Steve, your question on just transition, probably best for me to leave that to Phil, actually, because he's, he's got the, uh, the gen on that. Uh, Gentlemen, you talked about houses, so I didn't get your name. Alec. Alec, hi Alec. Um, yes, um, look, one of the, the most one of the most difficult things that we've got to do um, is not our new build housing. New build housing is actually relatively easy. Um, putting in the, the, the standards that will get to, you know, properly insulated, zero emissions, uh, positive. What we also need to be doing is then ensuring that we have localized grids whereby the uh, solar panels that we will have on those roofs um, we're able to trade not simply into the national grid and then out again but actually in localized grids me selling from my house to you to your battery wall um, to power our battery vehicles or whatever because we need that battery storage facility for the intermittency that we have with, with the renewables. So micro generation, new grid structure, absolutely vital that we look at all of that as part of our new build. The really difficult stuff though is actually in retrofitting older properties. You just wonder, you know, I, I was loving, I, you know, I, I live in Wembley. Okay, Wembley is, is a wonderful, wonderful area, um, but it ain't half as pretty as some of the buildings that you've got here. Um, and, um, you know, retrofitting those brings you, you know, go to those almshouses, beautiful almshouses. What are you going to do? Are you going to go and say, actually, we're going to come in all that beautiful stone, we're going to put, put insulation on the front of it? No, you're not. Are you going to go to the people who are living there? and say, actually, you know what, we want to move you out, we want to completely jiggle around with all your furniture, redecorate everything, and, and stick insulation on your walls on the inside. It's difficult. It, it's really difficult how we move forward on that energy efficiency, and that is part of the transition that we really need to make. So, housing is the area that this government is falling behind on. It's energy efficiency and transport. Our power sector, we're making real progress in, in reducing emissions in our power sector. What we're not doing is making the same progress in our transport and our energy efficiency. And that's what we need to do. And that is what Phil will now talk about. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, Steve, you know, thanks for the point, really. Um, the Campaign Against Climate Change, um, which is a, a national organisation, trade unions, voluntary organisations. It argues that the, the, about the false friend, you know, the, the jobs from shale, the false friend that we can, uh, we should continue to reinvest in, in offshore oil and gas exploration. And it says, I mean, actually as Barry very, very well outlined um, in his, when he was referring to his speech at Labour Party Conference last year, which actually I'm not, I'm not beginning to remember the linking of the we are against fracking but we are for this. So it's not that we are opposed just, but we have other ideas. And I was thinking too about Ken County Council and about this town and about the opportunities in this town when people talk about fracking and if you stop it then you're, 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 you're reducing employment and training opportunities and decent jobs. You can say, yeah, there's a few of those. We have far more uh, opportunities in other uh, in other ways, in home insulation, renewable energy, in, you know, in, in transforming um, you know other industries in low carbon ways of producing your, and securing jobs. So I you know I think that I just this one thing I wanted to add actually without naming names, is it Matthew? Yeah. Yeah we were at the station. Oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> 
Now, without naming names, a certain politician of a certain party, like Labour, found out that we were talking about fracking tonight and was trying to persuade us, actually, that we should be talking about other ways to bring opportunities into this area and stop opposing fracking. Because it was necessary, because it would produce opportunity. What, what she, was she, she was saying that uh, the jobs created from fracking um, should be prioritised basically over other forms of investment is the gist of what I got from the conversation. Yeah. And so, you know, you will get this and it's, it, it's just, it makes me, it made me feel pretty mad actually. It really did because, you know, you, you, you know that that is actually, that the whole argument is what's required. It's not that you, know, you couldn't create 10, 15, 8, 9, I don't know, 25, 200 jobs out of fracking, but where the real jobs and the real future and the real decent long-term opportunities for young people entering the labour market or those that are in work but are in jobs that are under threat are clearly in other areas. So we have this notion of a just transition. Remember the phrase. It's that argument that says there is a transition, it needs to be fair, it needs to be felt to be fair, and for that you need to engage people from the workplace in the community and say, yes, there are these false friends being offered to you, but this is the real, this is the real future. And it's really worth in the campaigning you develop thinking through these alternatives so that when you're arguing to stop fracking, you're, you're saying to start other things and to, to develop other opportunities. So this isn't just a no campaign, but it is very much a yes campaign. This is what we want. We've got just a couple of few things to do, and then maybe if Barry still have a bit of time, you can quickly, you know. Yeah. Um, it's someone's birthday today. And um, the person is actually one of our own, from our very own branch, who has left our day to be with us today. And we would like you to just present this little gift that we've got for her as we join to sing happy birthday to our own very Margaret, the treasurer. <laughs> Tonight made it. She worked, you know, so tirelessly, getting all stressed out, drawing me to a negative zone. <laughs> but you know what? She's done fantastic. She's done an amazing job. And I just want us to appreciate Jill and her husband. And we've also we also got gifts for them as well. So I'm going to call our secretary, Julia, to please come forward and help me to meet you. Thank you.
Into this, uh, into this meeting, and I want some of it back <laughs> because we've got an election to fight, yeah. possibly this year, right? Yeah. We, we fought a good one already, but that was just the warm up, that was just the first <laughs> round. So, I want you to dig deep. We've got two buckets at the back there's a, uh, a big one and a little one. You can put the, uh, put the large amounts into the big one. And if you haven't got the little one, that's all right. You put it into the little one. But as whatever, please give what you can as you leave. As you leave. But you don't have to leave right now. I think Barry, Vince and uh, Phil do have to leave right now because they've got a train to catch. Um, but I want to thank, thank them very much. So much. Um, yeah, when I mean, Jill really fell off her, her chair when uh, you know, she, she wrote uh, to Barry saying, Would he speak? And within a few days, he got the answer. Yes, he did. And I want to thank you so much for the yeah. Okay, people, thank you so much. We appreciate you coming. We love you. And there's going to be many, many more of these meetings coming. We've got another one coming up in October, October 14. Please put it in your diary. That is the Black History Month, which we are also running from our branch in support you know, of CLP. And I also will be chairing that. And I've got another MP coming. But this time it's a lady, so I won't be getting any kisses. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. For yeah. oh, those of you that we don't see in the branch meetings or CLP meetings, please do not be a stranger. We love you. We want you to come on board. Everybody is important. Your input, no matter how little you think it is, it actually goes your long way. The bar is now open. <laughs> Can I, just, can I just say, in, in, in Lancashire now, we really are on the front line, all right? And we, we're desperately, we need help from the Labour Party. We've got gentle We've got people being arrested. We've got the rig coming in today. We fought long and hard for six years. We managed to stop it ourselves. But we really, really, we need the unions on board. We need Labour on board. We need every single person out in the country to help us stop it in Lancashire right now on Preston New Road. There's a community there now, living in fear they have done now for the last four years. We've took it to the nth degree. We're fighting a judicial review. So we need funds in. So if you go on Team Frack Free, we'll give you all the information on there. Team Frack Free, simple enough to, to ask about it. But we desperately need help on the front line. And that is Preston New Road in Lancashire. We're taking on Sajid Javid, we're taking on this government, and we're taking on Quadrilla. We've beaten Quadrilla at every single level. We've been cheated. Sajid Javid has allowed the fracking into our community. We've fought it for six, six months now. I'm living on three hours sleep. I'm travelling all over the country. We really, really need every single person now. We nail it in Lancashire, we nail it everywhere. So please help us. Please give us your numbers, give us contacts. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Thank you.